and once again on a December Friday morning, we are with Mr. Vinnie Caggiano, and we are continuing our Beatles series with what are we looking at today? Well, uh, before I begin, I'd like to present my a radical group of anti-unusualists cup. <laughs> anti-unusualists? Right. Well, we're off and running. Where are we at today? Okay, well, we're going to look at the really, really a toss-off album, A Magical Mystery Tour. This was, all right, uh, you know, after the peak which was Sgt. Pepper's, it was the big final blast uh, in terms of, uh, I think, you know, representing the height of the 60s and what all that involved, you know, that was the big orgasm of it. Then it starts to go downhill. I, I, um, I had a book called Revolution in the Head that was a really good book um, about the Beatles and it would just take each song and go through their history chronologically, but it, it, it separated the, the book into three sections. One was on the rise, at the top, and then coming down. Mm. And coming down was right after Peppers. Oh. Right after Peppers, uh, you know. That's when, what happened was this, um, first of all, we get a disgruntled George Harrison who wanted to leave the band by then completely. Uh, you know, he was off on his own trip, and he got just tired of being a Beatle. Yeah. Uh, I, I had a quick question. Were they were they they were done touring they were done touring at this point okay. that's why peppers was peppers okay. all right they had plenty of time to put this thing together which was a boon for them in the beginning but then which which was their downfall in the end because they were just fucking around after a while yeah. that's really what was going on i mean they they were the beatles and they felt like they could do anything reminds me of a time i had a friend uh, back in new york an actress canadian actress helen shaver and she invited me and my wife out for um, to go to this comedy club because she knew Nobody else knew, but Eddie Murphy was going to make a surprise visit, right? Was this just the comedy at this comedy, s not the store? What was it? Do you remember the name it of the club? A, oh, jeez, I forget now. Because I, I, we, we actually sang, Acme Vocal sang in this, the store that he started going to. Yeah. Well, on the Upper East Side, I think. It was on the Upper East Side, probably yeah. the same place. Yeah. Uh, in any case, uh, Helen was friends with Eddie Murphy, you know. So uh, we see the show. And I see him, like, after all these, like, comics desperately trying to get laughs out of people, Eddie Murphy steps up, and he hardly makes a move, and people start laughing. He's dripping with diamonds and gold, just, huh. you know, the guy is gleaming with jewelry, and you could tell he's not even trying, because no matter what he does, people think it's just the funniest thing uh. in the world, even when he's not doing anything. Uh. And you can see in him the disillusionment, like he doesn't have to work for a laugh anymore and people are laughing for the wrong reasons after a while. That's the, what the case was with the Beatles. I mean, after a while, anything the Beatles did was great no matter what they yeah, did. Yeah, if nothing, it got a lot of attention. Yeah, and yeah. so they, they kind of lost that work ethic, save for Paul McCartney, who was, you know, a dedicated composer. It wasn't, for him, it wasn't just about the Beatles, it was about being a great musician and having a great band that can perform that music, you know. It wasn't about the image, yeah. you know. Lennon, at this point, was completely disgruntled with the image of the Beatles. You know, like, there was John Lennon, and then there was John Lennon the Beatle, who was this, like, you know, idolized uh, person, and he, he despised that. He just wanted to be who he was. Now, in this era, it's just when he stopped taking acid. So we have the, the psychedelic, heavy psychedelic influence. So what we're about to speak about is I Am the Walrus, which yeah. is, I love this piece of music. I was just analyzing it today. It's, it's just totally remarkable piece of music. And again, this is something he did once experimentally. He never did it again. Um, but in any case, a lot of the, the Beatles uh, researchers have said, like, I Am the Walrus is, is a signal of a change in Lennon's uh, perspective musical okay. perspective and and perspective as a star you know because basically he had stopped taking acid and he's still there's still the psychedelic vibe going on but if you notice in the lyrics there's the the old acerbic you know uh kind of pissed off and sarcastic john lennon hmm. you know and you could see that in the lyrics now supposedly he set off to make something that made no sense a kind of jabberwocky song but the fact of the matter is, there is, there are moral points that he... There's a thread through things. Yeah, yeah. I remember when I was like about 12 years old, and me and this guy Scott Butler, I think he was also a musician, but we sat down and tried to analyze the meaning, um, the hidden meaning of I Am the Walrus, 
you know, uh, uh, elementary penguin singing Hare Krishna. <laughs> we actually tried to find derive some sort of meaning out of that. Of course, it wasn't, but, you know, th there were little messages inside the song, like the anti, uh, you know, uh, militarized police kind of thing, you know, Mr. City, policeman sitting, pretty little policeman in, the ro in a row. Um, you know, see how they run like pigs from a gun, and of course pig was the catch word in those days for a cop. Um, there, there were other little pointed sarcasms, you know, in there. It's a dumb question. Was he living in New York at this point? Well, I have no idea. I, I think I, he was definitely with Yoko at this point. Okay. And I wonder, probably... Because New York, I think New York maybe changes your perspective as well. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely, you know. Okay, well, we got off. I, I just kind of wondered if New York had had anything to do with maybe uh, this. It could quite well be. I mean, look, if he was hanging out with Yoko at this point, he's certainly going to all the avant-garde, uh, you know. The art movement stuff. and everything. Movement stuff in, in, in New York, you yeah. know. I think she lived in New York at the time. I think so. I don't she, know. I, that's I, how we But I, I'm curious. I don't know if she moved to, like, London for a while or something. Well, it's something really to check into anyway. Yeah. All right, well, uh, this song, this song is, is just so amazing. It blows, and George Martin must have had a hoot working with this one. Um, first of all, remember I talked about wandering major chords? There, it, this song has one, two, three, four, five, six, A, B, C, D, E, F, G. Yes, seven major chords, and not a single minor chord. Now, if you recall, there are... Uh, three major chords per key. He's got seven major chords. So he's borrowed from what other keys? He's borrowed from all the natural keys. A, B, C. Oh, he has. Well, actually, I'm wrong about that. He's made major chords out of all the natural notes. A, B, C, D, E, F, and G. Okay. A, B, C, D, E, F, G. All right? Which is is pretty daring. It's, it's you know, it's... Well, it's do you think he was unusual. aware of it? Well, that's the big, you know, was he, yeah. he going to set out to write a, car, a song with all major chords? There's a possibility because, you know, bands like The Who were coming up, and if there was, any, if there was ever a master of writing songs with just major chords, it, it would be Peter Townsend. He, he really did a good oh. job with that. I recall, um, uh, uh, I forget the name of the song, though. major chords. And in fact, I never liked The Who until I got um, tickets to see uh, Tommy live in Austin. Oh, really? It had a great band. You could never see them. They were silhouetted in behind, the, oh, okay. behind this curtain. But you saw, they purposely made it like that. They, they were just a silhouette. Yeah. The band was great. And I, when I saw the play, suddenly it was like I understood what Peter Townsend was doing compositionally. And he was great. He did great stuff. It was very, huh. very him, you know. So uh, what we have here are wandering major chords, and it's interesting because he has like uh, a few sections here. You have the intro, which goes B, A, G, F, E, right? And then you have one verse that goes A, A with a G bass, C, D, A. And then you have another verse that goes uh, A, G, D with an F-sharp bass, F-G-A. So basically what I'm saying is he's he's using all this, this array of seven different chords. And the fascinating part is when we get to the end repetition, the coda part, that vamps over and over, he uses all of them at once. Like he introduces them in a verse and introduces another set in another verse, but he puts them all together in the end. And it's really wild. So is that a whole, is that a whole different movement to a song? Within the song? This song, structurally, is very bizarre. Um, oh, I'm sorry, what's your question? Uh, well, is that last part that you're talking about, that sort of mashup or whatever it is, it, it still follows sort of within the structure of the song somehow? Oh, yeah, yeah, okay. yeah, yeah, it definitely follows thematically. And in fact, the whole, the whole ending is based on the intro. Well, how do you want to, do you want to take this where you go through the intro and then you go through the next part? Yeah, yeah. That sort of thing? All right, yeah. Now, uh, this, I, I, in a way I was going to ask you if we could, um, we could use the piano because this, I wanted to demonstrate something, but I, I think I could do it on guitar. Okay. 
The intro chords are B, A, G, F, E. And is there some sort of melody attached to this? Or is it just an instrumental? Then it goes B7, giving us the blues because we go to D now. And D7. Now this is 5, 4, 1 in a blues kind of way. Yeah. Alright, so that's the intro. It's B, A, G, F, E, E7, D, D7. Which takes us to the key of A in a blues style resolution. Okay. Alright, this D7, that's, that's typically blues. In fact, you know how the classical resolution is 5, 7, and 1? E7 okay. to A. Right. In the blues, you could say that the, that its resolution is 4, 7 to 1. Okay. okay. All right. So now, the uh, reason I wanted to use the piano is, I could tell how we wrote the song. If you listen, in fact, let's, let's give it a listen to the intro here. Okay, and pause it there. Now, I don't know if you notice, there's quite so, quite a bit of dissonance there. Mm -hmm. What he's doing is he's on the piano and he's doing this. Um, all right. Now I'll see if I could replicate the bass line. We got B. Man. All right. And Martin, I could tell what Lennon did was he was playing that B vamp, just down, 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 and he's moving the bass line, A, B, G, F, E, right? Mm -hmm. Well, M Martin decided to go avant-garde even further with it because when he arranged the cellos, they're actually not playing just the notes, B, A, G, F, E. Mm -hmm. They're playing the entire chord. Oh. And this is called polytonality, when you clash chords against each other. That's why I thought on the piano I could really demonstrate it, but like... Um, uh, so what did he have, like four or five cellos or something on this? Uh, I don't know what the... It could be just a string quartet. Anyway, <laughs> so, uh, so we get that dissonance. It, again, it's... Um, and normally that's a dissonance that I really can't stand. It, wow. To me it shows a real lack of it in being informed about how things should move. But I think, you know, I think Martin let them get away with a lot because, like, the intent was purely innocent and artistic. It wasn't, I'm going to be really, like, uh -huh. bizarre, except for the sake of the song, which is kind of jabberwocky, so you want some weirdness in it, you know. Uh -huh. But it wasn't weirdness for the sake, pretentious weirdness. It was just weirdness, you know. Sure. Anyway, so we have the intro, A. And this is all against the... Right. come into the verse and what we have is an A, another A but with a G in the bass. This right here is an A chord, I'm putting a G. I'm using, I'm barring. Right. Yeah. Now we go to a C chord which wasn't used yet. D, A. Alright? Mm -hmm. Now let's see what we got. Uh, Wait a second. Right, right, right. All right, so we got... Wait, no, I'm sorry. Little cello line there. <laughs> um, 
Uh, so we have A, A with a G bass, and in a surprising C chord, because A actually resolves to G, D, but he's going to C, and then to D. Sitting on a cornflake. Now we don't do the... Right, we're going A to G now. It's a different verse. He has two kinds of verse in okay. the song. So the first one I just did is, is the first type of verse uh, arrangement. And this is the next one. A, G, D, G, A. Now that particular progression, bands like Chicago... And Al Alvin Lee, I think it was. You've heard this before, yeah. Yeah, even Led Zeppelin. Uh, uh. This is. You could. Uh. Very common. Very common. Mm -hmm. uh, what was the other song I thought of? Um, oh, uh, I hate the song, Alvin Lee. I'd love to change the world, but I don't know what to do, so I'll leave it up to you. Uh, yeah, it's like... That sort of thing. Uh -huh. right? So that became, like, because Lennon did this, everybody else picked it up. They found a new chord progression. They called it theirs when they really should have called it Lennon's. Mm -hmm. um, just well, was it even his, though? No, no, there's no copyright yeah. chord progressions, but he was the first to enunciate something like that, uh, so, okay. that blatantly, you know. Yeah. Um, Are we talking, what, here, 67, 68? Yeah, about 68, something yeah. like that. Okay. Yeah, okay. And again, this is where things get weird societally as well, because 67 was the summer of love. Right. 68 was the summer of hell. I yeah. mean, there were, there were assassinations and riots and, and uh, the war. It was just a horrible, horrible year in 1968. Yeah. So uh, people are starting to come down pretty quick from the big party.